Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here, and today we find ourselves in space, where you are the leader of a race from within a failing unity. You'll be fighting in battles to hold territories while pushing to conquer others. You'll be trying to gain the upper hand by breaching others of home world while trying to protect your own sovereignty and be the first to win the war. Over Battle, the All War, is area controlled tabletop space warfare with a twist. It includes a unique utilization of cross genre gaming mechanics generally unused in wargaming, such as drafting, engine building, worker placement, and semi co op components, all wrapped inside of a classic area control wargame wrapper. It's for two to four players, takes two to four hours to play for ages 14 and up, and published by Scyther Gaming. It's on Kickstarter right now, so I'm going to show you how the game works, and I'll see you on the other side. This is a Kickstarter preview, so all the art and components you see here are prototype. You're going to want to check the Kickstarter link in the description of this video to see all the final art and components. Now this game comes with a woven playmat that folds up into the box, that's what we're looking at here. I'm going to be playing with the neoprene mat that is from Game Toppers for this video. Now you would think with a game that lasts up to four hours and when you're moving a thousand pieces that there'd be a huge ginormous setup with lots of time to set up, but not in this case. One of the cool things about Over Battle is that there isn't really a setup. You put the mat out and you're starting right away because actually setting up the board is a, is a big part of the game and it's a lot of the strategy of the game as well. Because at the beginning of the game, players are going to roll for initiative. They're going to be drafting their planets. And so there's some standard sized planets and then some larger planets. So starting with the player with the, low, you know, the best initiative, they're going to be drafting the planets, and these, you know, between themselves, don't do anything different. It's just how they look. So players will start to draft those. And so decisions matter right away. Like when you draft your second planet, you're going to decide whether you're taking a standard one or a large one. And sometimes you'll be forced to take a large one. Like if, if the player takes this, then the last two players at draft have to take large ones, which there's some positives and negatives of it. There's more areas, which means you can control more of it, which means you can get more currency uh, to essentially build up your army more. Uh, but it's also more susceptible to people coming into it and things like that. So there's some strategy right off the bat. Everyone's going to get two planets. Now, I mentioned everyone gets planets. There's a twist in this game I'll get to later, so it's not quite a true statement. But there's lots of moons after you draft your planets that players will draft. And again, there's no different playing differences between these. It's just the ones that you like the best. So players will be drafting these moons, uh, again, in initiative order. And then players will be drafting asteroids. Again, just taking the one that they like that looks the best. Now, then every player in initiative order is going to be able to place. Now, this is an open space. Remember, we've got a six foot table here, and players are going to be able to place their homeworld planet. That's their first planet. They're going to place this anywhere. Now, you can see it's open space, and there's different grid lines and such. You, send, you simply line up, and these are nice and neoprene. You're going to put these, line it up so it's right there in the space, and you can see all the lines sort of line up. And let's say that's their home planet, and let's just say that this. Uh, essentially is their moon that they want. Again, that lines up too like that. So they've got a touching moon and their, their home planet. This is known as their sort of sovereign world. It's their starting planet and their moon there. And then that initiative order, other players are going to place. And again, it's open. So you could place it, you know, way out in the, you know, far away from other players, or you can get like right up pretty kind of close to them. And it's going to divide your strategy as to how close do you want to be to people. Now, even though this board's big, it gets crowded quick and you'll feel the tension right at the beginning of the game. And here's what I mean, after all the planets and asteroids and moons are placed, the board's already full. Each player is going to get a shield, I have it flat so you can read it, and it's going to have a different unity on there. Now each of the unities have different uh, starting units. Now this is going to give them a little bit of asymmetry, and over here is going to show you all the different units that are in the game. Now this, the types of units and the costs are the same for everybody, and the types of units are essentially the same for everyone, but the starting units are different, which gives everyone a slightly different starting position with what they have. Now each player's starting planet is going to look the same of their color, and this is the one that we just showed you. They're going to have an infantry unit on each of the spots here on the planet around it. And in the middle they're going to have an ion cannon, and on their moon they're going to have an infantry like this. Now each of them we show you crystals. This is going to be important because everywhere you control or move through uh, on your turns and such will get a crystal. This is going to show you how many areas you sort of control, and this is going to be important for the currency of the game, how, much how many credits you get to spend to get more units at the end of each turn. 
Now, the object of the game is to try to infiltrate someone else's home world. Now, let's say the yellow player ended up getting a mech on their world and they took this infantry out like this, um, and you know, they ended up controlling this like this. Now, on all other players' turns after this player, they have the ability to try to take this guy out because if this player is now controls even one spot on anybody else's home world, and this player's own home world is completely protected by themselves, they'll win the game. But everyone else gets one more turn to try to do that. So that's what you're trying to do is infiltrate somebody else's home world, keeping yours completely protected. However, I've been holding a secret from you. One of the big twists in the game is one of the players is going to be the red player. They're known as the Sin. And what they do is they actually are sort of allied with every other player. They start with one infantry on every other player's home territory, and they're going to fight and defend with whoever they're with. Really interesting that they actually work with people for most of the game. And they don't even get a starting planet. They get a starting moon, whichever one is left over, and they're going to have some of their starting people there as well. However, at some point during the game, you know that these sin are no longer going to be on your side. They're going to turn on you. And one of the ways this can happen is if we showed you earlier, someone infiltrates someone's home world. When that happens, the sin automatically turn on everybody. And regardless of where they are, they are now part of the war and they're working against everybody. So you, it's a very interesting twist that you're sort of working with them, but you don't want them to get too powerful because at some point, you know, they're going to turn. And once they turn, you don't want them to be too powerful against you and everybody else. Now there's also a timed way after uh, three rounds you'll roll some dice and they might turn against everybody. The fourth round they have a 50% chance of turning and after the fifth round if nobody's infiltrated a homeworld the sin become part of the war as well. So there's a timed way that they become so you know what's going to happen but you'd never know exactly when because it can be triggered by someone's actions or it can be triggered at the end of a round depending on some dice rolls. So some of their starting units will be placed out, others will not yet be placed, but then everyone's gonna have some credits to buy a bunch of units. So you've got 150 ground unit credit and 200 fleet unit credit, depending on which side it is, ground units, fleet units. And you'll be buying this credit and be grabbing these different uh, units and be placing them behind your shield so that people don't even know which ones you bought. Now each player has a tray with all of their units. And even though this is a prototype, these are the nicest prototypes I've ever received for a Kickstarter project. Now here's a closer look at what some of these units look like, even in this prototype. And here's some of the other units. Now each of those units has a card and each player has a set of these cards and it's going to show everything about that unit, like how far they can move, 0 to 3, 0 to 1, 0 to 3, their attack and defensive values and things like that when they're in combat also tell you certain special abilities that those have. Now here's a closer look at one of the cards, the mech here. Now one cool thing about this is on the back of all these cards is a QR code. Now if you scan that with your phone, it will actually bring up that unit and it has a 3D model. You can turn it around and look at it, see how it looks all cool in 3D. But you can also scroll down and it has some more information that doesn't fit on the card, some background about this specific unit and sometimes some strategies that go along with it. So once everybody has spent all their units and put them down, everyone is in initiative order going to place out their units five at a time. And right now we see that two players have placed mechs in the same spot on a secondary planet and that's legal right now and they're going to end up having to resolve that once all the units have been placed. So once the board's been strategically set up as part of the game, uh, again players are going to roll for their initiative, the lowest number is always the best, and you're going to go in that order, of course the red sin uh, until they're part of the war is always last, uh, but each player is going to go through this, declarations, combat movement, resolutions, secondary movement, collecting income, and buying, you know, reinforcements. Now during declaration you're essentially going to be putting little dice out saying what you're planning on doing this turn. It helps you track all the things that you're going to try to do and then you sort of resolve those into combat. But just to show you, you know like like this battleship can move 0 to 3. They're typically they're built at the space station, so let's say it was built here, and you can move it 1 to 3. Now interestingly enough, we have some asteroids here that was set, that were set up and one of them is to go into the orbit here. And this orbit carries it all the way to here, and then it could jump to this orbit for two, goes up here, and three like that. So you can use sort of the orbits around the asteroids to help you get around. Now each of the sort of asteroids, planets, moons that you either go through or stay in uh, are going to get, gain a crystal that's going to help you gain so, some credits at the end of your turn to be able to buy more units. We'll show you that in just a minute. So let's talk about the basics of combat. Let's say on our turn we move this infantry and mech in with this other yellow mech here. 
So each player would roll a die for each of the units. Now we have two, we have the blue mech, the blue infantry, and let's just say the yellow mech, they'd, be, they'd have their own card where they're sitting, they roll. Now the lowest number is the best, one is the best number. Now mechs will attack on a six or less, they defend on a six or less, the infantry is better on defense. They defend on a, f uh, a four or less, but their attack isn't very good. You have to roll a two or a one in order to attack. Now let's say this rolled. The nine is not less than a two or less, so it does not attack. This one's a five. It's less. It's six or less, so this attacks. But the other player's defended happened. So this player would defend this mech, and this one would not hit him, so it wouldn't have been defeated. However... Let's say in this case, the yellow mech rolled a seven, which would not defend, and this player would attack them, and then essentially it's gone. The unit is just off the map. Now, of course, there was a crystal where this moved from, and this player is now gone, so they take their crystal away. Now this player has it like that. Now let's say they, this was the beginning of their turn, and they wanted to move their mech two, and this one one. Well, that's pretty cool because everywhere, you, again, you move through or are, is you're gonna get crystals again, and that's gonna help you with the currency at the end of the round I'll talk about in just a moment. Now let's take combat to another level. Let's say there was a bomber that also went there. They can go through orbit. They could also, you know, go in and attack on ground as well. So let's say this player now had a bomber which has two dice to roll when they're attacking, only one if it's defending. So it's really good at attacking, not very good at defending. And let's say the yellow player actually had an infantry there as well. I'm just showing you. So the yellow is going to have infantry and mech. Now notice that these cards have something extra. This is Cassie and has a down arrow. This is Cassie and has an up arrow. So here we have the Cassie system, which is the combat assault system. It has three levels, ground, above ground, and below ground. Think of three planes, a 3D area of attack. So the, the mechs don't have an up or down arrow on their card, so they're in the middle, sort of the ground level. Now, here we have the attackers. So the, the, the mechs here will attack with a six, and this mech's going to defend on a six. This uh, infantry, let's say, was being defended with a, with a four. Uh, and the infantry, our infantry, attacks with a two, and we have a bomber that attacks with an eight. That's how you set up the attack and defend by default. However, optionally, those units that can use the, the, the Cassie system can move up or down depending on what their card says. So the bomber can move up, meaning it's not on ground level, it's coming from above, and its attack was an eight, but it goes up one more to a nine, because it's coming from a different level, has a little bit of an advantage there. Now, the defender, the, the, the infantry can go down as well to go sort of bunker down into a bunker. So it's going to go down underneath. It's going to, it's going to be a defender of five. I'm going to place it here, but it's defending at a level five. It gets a plus one. And let's say this person also bunkered down and their attack went from a two to a three. It's always a plus one because they're underground like that. And so that's sort of how things happen with the combat assault system. It's a really cool way that some of the units can use this sort of three dimensional combat. However, let's take that first example. When we moved in, let's say the yellow player's mech there, but the red sin infantry was there too. So now when this combat happens, these, uh, the blues, the attackers, the yellow is the defender, but the red is the defender too. They're going to help defend for that because they work with whoever they're with. And conversely, if, it was, if, if this player was here like this and they moved in, the red player moves with them, and now these two are the attackers against these defenders. So the red sin uh, are going to be sort of working with other players whether they want to or not. Now when it's the sin's turn, when they move, they will be placing crystals like normal. However, each round, they have to touch each of the crystals once in order to be able to keep them there. Now, all the other unities, the way they score the, their economy is every place you saw a crystal, they'll get point, uh, credits, essentially. So there's multiple spaces on a planet. Every one of those you have a crystal on, you'll get 10 credits. Every uh, ast uh, asteroid, you'll get 20, and every moon, you'll get 40. So you add all those credits up, and you're going to essentially be spending those credits for different units and then placing reinforcements. So each player's turn is going to make declarations of what you're doing. You're going to do the combat movement. You're going to be resolu resolution. You're going to be moving those other secondary non-combat moves, collecting income, and then reinforcements. That's the next player's turn in initiative order. Now, I mentioned the Sin has some different economy. They only earn half a value if they're co-located in a territory with somebody else. So instead of getting 10 on a planet, they're going to get 5. Uh, but if they're all alone, they'll get the full 10. But again, they have to touch each area once per round to maintain their economic value. So it makes it a little bit harder for them to do that. Now, speaking of economy, all the other unities essentially have mission goals. The first time, if they're able to get 250 credits on one turn, and then later on, on a, uh, get 300, they'll be able to get a commander, up to two commanders. These commanders will basically help them attack or defend pretty much any battle they're in around the entire board. 
Now I'm not gonna show you all the units of what they all do. You can kind of look at the Kickstarter page and see that, but uh, interestingly enough, when you get these different fleets, some of them have to be produced only at a space station, which looks like this out in space, and that's where they are. The other ones can be produced at the shipyard as well, so they have to come up and come out in certain spots like that. Now you might be wondering, how do you get ground units to different spots? Well, there's actually a transport you can buy, and this helps you pick up units, and then they can fly out and go to different areas like that. Also, this cool thing you can do is transwarp. As you, if you have a space station, uh, you can basically have the transport uh, pick up different units, and then you can transwarp them to another place that you have a crystal anywhere out on the board. It's pretty cool. So players will go through these general orders one at a time till a round is over once all of them are gone. Then they'll all re-roll for initiative, which is important because you might have the last turn in one round and have the first turn in the next round, which gives you sort of a leg up because you just got a bunch of reinforcements. Now you're able to use those right away. Now this will continue again until one player wins, which is having control of someone's sovereign uh, world or uh, territory uh, and for a whole turn until everyone else has a chance to knock them off while keeping their own uh, protected. That's how they win the game. But also this will continue going like this until uh, the sin essentially goes gets into the war and is no longer working with everybody else. And at that point, the sin is basically just like all the other players, all, you know, all the rules are back to normal for them, and they're now rolling for initiative, they're not always last. Now the game is for two to four players. I just showed you a four player game. Uh, if you play a two player game, there's a thick line here at number 15, and the two player game you only use from here to the left, and then there's another line for a third player. So the board scales for the amount of players. Now in a three player game, one of them will be the sin. You can also play without it, but it's definitely more fun with it. With two players, each player takes uh, two different unities and there is no sin with a two player game. Well, there you have over battle, the all war. It's the war game that isn't a war game that is a war game. Innovations and new play experiences open up this overall genre to many players who have never experienced war games before. Now, if you'd like to see all the final art and components and all the different pledge levels available, you can click the link below me in the description of this video, and it will take you directly to the Kickstarter project page. And I'm sure the fine folks at Scyther Gaming would love your support.